Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together this morning. Thank you for each one who is here and for those that may be watching online. And Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you that it is there to give us direction and guidance. It's there to comfort us. It's there to challenge us and to change us. And Father, we pray today that as we gather to worship you, that, Father, uh, we would worship you in spirit and in truth. May we not just sing the words to the song, but may we sing them with understanding and meaning. And then as we have opportunity to open your word this morning, we pray that by your spirit you would minister to our hearts as we listen to what you would say to us. So bless this our time together. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite those here to stand and join our worship team as we worship, and then that will be followed by the children's video. Oh, 
From the time Jesus was young, he spent his time listening to and thinking about Scripture. He talked about Scripture with others. And he spent time talking to God in prayer. Because of this, Jesus knew Scripture and used it to spread hope and help others fight against sin and evil. One day, Jesus went out to the desert to pray. After 40 days, he was tired and hungry, and the devil came to tempt him. First, the devil told Jesus, If you're really the Son of God, Tell this stone to become bread. 
But Jesus said, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus had read this in scripture, so he knew how to answer the devil with truth. Next, the devil took Jesus to the top of the temple and said, Throw yourself to the ground. If you do, God will tell his angels to save you. But again, Jesus answered with scripture. He said, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Last, the devil took Jesus to the top of a high mountain and said, I'll let you rule over all the kingdoms of the world. All you need to do is worship me. But Jesus said, Go away, Satan. The scriptures say, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. After that, the devil knew there was nothing else he could say. So he left and angels came to take care of Jesus. All of us will be tempted to do things that are wrong sometimes. But when we read scripture and take it to heart, we find hope and learn God's good way. That means when temptations come, we'll be able to use scripture to say no, just like Jesus did when he was tempted. Well, as we think of our young families, let's uh, be praying for them. This is March break, and uh, so pray for extra grace for parents uh, this coming week, and uh, trust that the kids will have a great time uh, with the snow falling. I'm sure they're going to find lots to do. Let's continue as well to pray for those that have health needs, and uh, we're not going to go through the whole list again, but uh, just continue to uphold Uh, them in prayer as God brings them to your mind. And then I trust you'll be continually praying for our world situation in these days. Would you join me as we unite our hearts together in prayer? Father and our God, we do thank you for the opportunity just to come before you, to lift up, Lord, those needs that are present with us, Thank you that you are a God that delights to hear from us. Father, not just a list of the things that we want or need, but Father, you desire to also hear us praise you and worship you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done in each of our lives. Thank you for the way you provide for us each and every day. Your word says that daily you load us with benefits. And Lord, already in this day, you have loaded us with benefits. And Father, unfortunately, many times we miss those. We just take them for granted. We forget to say thank you. And so we pause and we just say thanks for all that you have done. Father, we do pray for the young families of this church. And Father, as the kids are on March break, we just pray for your safety to be upon them. Lord, that you would refresh them, that, Father, you would encourage them. This has been a difficult couple of years for them. Father, many are struggling, and we just pray that you and your grace would come alongside them and show your love to them, and that, Father, you would presence yourself in them. May they come to know you personally as their Lord and Savior early in life, and then grow in grace and knowledge of who you are. Pray for their parents, Father, that you would give them wisdom as they raise them. And Father, for us as a church family, that we would come alongside them as well, and we would be there to pray for them and to encourage them as they seek to raise these kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Father, we pray for a number that are in need of your touch this day. And Father, we lift them up to you. We thank you that we can commend them to you, but Father, you already know them. You know their situation. You know the plans that you have for them. Father, we just pray that you would presence yourself with them today. May they know that you are with them. May they know that you have a a plan and a purpose for them. And uh, Father, we pray for those that would be caring for them, that you would give them an extra measure of grace as well in these days. And Father, as we are mindful of what's going on in our world, we Our our hearts are broken for the loss of life that's taking place. Father, we thank you for your church. Father, not only in the Ukraine, but in, Father, the countries surrounding them. Thank you for the efforts that they are doing to help those 
caught up in this conflict. Father, our desire, our prayer would be that you would bring this to a quick and speedy resolution, that, Father, this war would be ended, that, Father, your word would continue to go forth in power in Ukraine. And Father, we pray for the countries that are around that you would give wisdom in knowing how to respond to this great tragedy. Father, we pray for our own leaders, and uh, you have asked us to uphold them in prayer, and so we do that, that, Father, first and foremost, they would turn to you for the wisdom that they need, and that, Father, in your word, they would find that truth. And Father, we thank you for each one who makes up a part of this church family. We thank you for the ability that you've given us to give back to this work. And Father, we thank you for each one who is supporting this ministry. We ask your blessing on them as they give. And that Father, we ask your blessing on the gifts that you would use them to further the impact of this ministry, not only here, but around the world. For all of this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today's question is this, and just before I ask it, I'm going to caution you not to answer out loud, all right? That will give you an indication of the kind of question we're going to be asking, all right? The question is this, what temptation do you struggle with the most? What temptation do you struggle with the most. You see, the reality is that we all face temptation. However, what you are tempted with may not be what I am tempted with. And so a follow-up question would be this. Am I powerless when it comes to temptation? Am I powerless when it comes to temptation? Today we want to look with you at an epic showdown to find that answer. Last week after the service, I was talking with someone, and they will go unnamed, but they commented on the graphic that was used to advertise this sermon. And uh, I don't know if you were watching the, adver- or the uh, announcements on the screen last week, but it was a picture of two men arm wrestling. And the comment this person made was to the effect that they didn't know that Jesus was an arm wrestler. Now, we know that Jesus grew up likely working in Joseph's carpentry shop. So I have no doubt that he was strong. We also know that he had brothers. And having grown up with brothers, I can probably surmise that there were tests of strength between them. Now, whether those were arm wrestling matches, I'm not going to draw a conclusion with only conjecture as a basis to draw that conclusion upon. But let's turn our attention to this wilderness showdown recorded for us in the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Now, you remember last week we looked at three verses with you. Well, today we had a time change, and I know you're all tired, so we're only going to look at two verses. All right? Can you stay awake for that long? Now, two verses doesn't mean it's going to be a short message. I just want you to know it's just two verses. All right? Mark chapter 1, let's pick it up in verse 12 and verse 13. It says this, At once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. May God add his blessing to his word as we Ponder it and consider it with you today. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father and our God, as we turn our attention to your word, we do invite your spirit to do his work here in this place, 
and in each of our lives. We pray that he would open our eyes to see your truth. He would open our ears to hear your truth. He would open our minds to understand your truth. He would open our hearts to be transformed by your truth. And then, once we leave, that he would open our mouth to proclaim your truth. So bless this time together as we consider these two verses. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I would draw to your attention in these verses is the relocation. The relocation. Notice the description. At once. Or in the King James it says immediately. Well, at once and immediately after what? Well, it's what we looked at last week. Immediately after the baptism of Christ. At once. After that declaration from the heavens that said, this is my beloved son. Immediately after that, it says, the spirit sent him. So notice, he was led by the spirit into this wilderness. It's interesting. What do we know about John the Baptist? Where did he spend most of his time? It says he came from the wilderness. He was clothed. And uh, I got thinking about that a little bit. Now, when John the Baptist was born, how old was his parents? Well, we know that Elizabeth was well past childbearing years. So I'm thinking in my mind that Probably his parents died Well, he was very young. And so he made his own way in the world. And he ended up out in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. Now Jesus is led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. And it says that he was there in the wilderness for 40 years days, 40 days. Well, that's the relocation. He moved from the Jordan River out into the wilderness. Why? What's the reason? Well, the last part of verse 13 gives us that answer. It says, he was being tempted by Satan. Being tempted by Satan. Notice the action, being tempted. It wasn't just he was tempted. He was being tempted. That means it was ongoing. That means it was constant. That means it was continual. It was an action that was happening. Who was tempting him? None other than Satan. None other than Satan himself. It wasn't one of his demons. It was Satan himself. The third thing I want to draw your attention to is the affirmation. We read in Hebrews chapter 4 these words, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Then we have these words, yet he did not, what? Sin. He was tempted in every way that we are, yet he did not sin. Let me ask you a question. Is it sin to be tempted? No. No. It only becomes sin when we give in to temptation, all right? We're all tempted. The question is, are we going to give in to it? Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Now, when it says he was tempted in every way which we are, what does that mean? Well, we need to go to another gospel to 
get that answer um, because Mark just sort of condenses the thing. I, I don't know if you're paying attention. We, we've already covered the two verses. Right? Were you paying attention? We've already covered the two verses. But the message isn't over yet. Sorry. I want to take us to Matthew's gospel and uh, Matthew's account of what happens here. Because Matthew goes into detail in regards to these temptations that Jesus faced from Satan. Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Matthew chapter 4. Beginning in verse 2, it says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Who was hungry? Jesus. It says, The tempter came to him. Who's the tempter? Satan. All right? And said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. All right? Now, we would read that and say, and we would say, well, that word if means Satan wasn't sure who Jesus was. No, Satan was fully. The word really means since, all right? Since you are the Son of God. You see, Satan knows who Jesus is. There's no question in his mind, all right? And what he's trying to do here is to stop Jesus from fulfilling God's will. Remember, the Father sent the Son to what? be the savior of the world. Satan knows that. He tried when Jesus was born to destroy him so that he couldn't fulfill that mission. Now he's trying to stop him again. And the way he does that is by tempting him. Since you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You see, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. Now, most of us can't go from breakfast to lunch. Right? Can you imagine 40 days? You think he's hungry? Yes. What did Jesus answer? He says, It is, what? Written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. As I thought of that temptation, what does it capture? Well, I, I've, I've got four C words as we work our way through these temptations. This one refers to cravings. Those things that we hunger for. All right? Jesus was tempted in all the ways that we are. Are we ever tempted with cravings? All right? Those things that we hunger for? All right? And we're all different. We all have different cravings, things that we desire, things that we, we just have to have. All right? For some, it may be food. For some, it may be alcohol. For some, it may be drugs. For others, it could be sex. All kinds of things consume us. What was Jesus' response to cravings. It is what? Written. Man shall not live on bread alone. In other words, you don't need to be defined by that. Instead, focus, crave the word of God. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Well, we move on. It says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. All right? And uh, interesting, one minute we're in the, the desert, the next we're in Jerusalem. And uh, they're up on the temple. And he says this, If you are the Son of God, or since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now, who's saying this? Satan is saying this, all right? For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan's quoting scripture. Well, sort of. All right? 
He, he, he's using scripture, but he's twisting it. What did Jesus respond this time? Jesus answered and said, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Do not put your, the Lord your God to the test. When I thought of this one, I, I thought of chances. All right? God will bail me out. I can do this. God's not going to let anything happen to me. Hey, why don't you try this? Once won't hurt you. God will bail you out. Because you're a child of God. Then it goes again. It says, again, the devil took him to a, a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. All this. Jesus, all this could be yours. Let me ask you a question. Who owns that? <laughs> right? It all belongs to God. Jesus spoke and those things came into being. All this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship God and him only. As I thought of this temptation, the word came to me, coveting. Coveting. All right. Those things that we strive for, whether it's wealth or fame or popularity. Those things that we crave, that the we, we, we want to get into that position. So those are the three temptations of Christ in the wilderness. But I want to take you to a fourth one. And it doesn't happen in the wilderness. It, it happens three years later. It's not directly from Satan, but it's motivated by Satan. Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 35, we read these words. The people stood watching. Watching what? Well, Jesus is hanging on the cross. And the rulers sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Now, this if is different than the ifs in the wilderness. The ones in the wilderness was Satan saying, since you are. These people are saying, you claim to be, and if you really are, then save yourself. Goes on and says the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews. Save yourself. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. All temptations, right? <laughs> All temptations. Jesus if you are who you say you are, prove it. What's the temptation here? Credibility. Have you ever had your credibility challenged? <laughs> How do you respond? Right. Let me ask you a question. Could Jesus have saved himself that day? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. But that wasn't the mission, was it? He didn't come to save himself. Who did he come to save? Us. Mankind. Let's go back to our text in Mark. The last part of verse 13 says this. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. We finish with this reminder. He was with the wild animals. (laughs) He's out in the wilderness. Out in the wilderness are wild animals. What does this speak to? To me, it speaks of security. Security. You see, those wild animals couldn't touch him. Why? Because God had his hand on him. He was protecting him. And then it says, and angels attended him. Here it speaks of sustaining. Sustaining the angels were there to minister to him. Well, there's the text. What are some things that you and I can take from that text as we go into this coming week, as we move forward in the days ahead? Number one, let me go back to where we started this morning. What temptation do you struggle with the most? You see, we need to know where our weaknesses are. We need to know where our, our, our point of uh, danger is. You see, once we know that, then we can take steps to shore up that area. We can invite somebody to be our accountability partner. We can uh, learn some scriptures that will specifically deal with that specific temptation. Secondly, I want you to take note of the fact that in all of his responses to Satan's temptations in the wilderness, Jesus resorted to the scriptures. It is written. It is written. All three of his responses come from the book of Deuteronomy, if you want to chase that down. A book that explains the law which was previously given by God to Moses. Moses is coming to the end of his life. And so in Deuteronomy, he takes the uh, law of God and he breaks it down for the people. He rehearses for the people what God expects from them. All three of Jesus' responses come from that book. In Psalm 119, the psalm we began with in the beginning of our service, In verse 11, we read this verse. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does that mean? How do we hide God's word in our heart? What's that? We memorize it. All right? If I were to give you a test today, if I were to hand each of you some paper and said, I want you to write out all the scripture that you know. How would you do? You see, you're not always going to have your Bible with you, are you? You know that Bible that you carry, and it's underlined, and you've got those passages marked, and you've got little notes that says, when I'm tempted here, this is what I do. You're not always going to have your Bible with you. But if we hide God's word in our heart, it gives us that resource to go back to. Jesus knew the word of God. And he used that to defeat Satan. As I mentioned, you also take note that Satan knows God's word, but he will twist it to serve his purposes. He's done that before, hasn't he? (laughs) He did that in the Garden of Eden with Eve. And now here he does it again with Jesus in the wilderness. He quotes from Psalm 91. 
And this is what Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12 say. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Sounds just like what Satan said, doesn't it? Except if you remember that we have talked to you previously about texts and contexts, right? That's the text. That's what it says. Satan just took that, ripped it out, and said, see, this is what the Bible says. If you test God, God will save you. Well, what's the context? Go back to verses 1 and 2. It says this, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You see, it's not about testing God. It's all about trusting God. Satan twisted it. This is why it's so important for you and I to know what God's word actually says. And then finally, I would remind all of us, Satan is an opportunist. Satan is an opportunist. He always attacks when we are vulnerable. When we are overtired. When we are stressed. When we are not feeling well. That's when he strikes. And he plants thoughts of doubt. He plants figments of our imagination. He does all kinds of things to throw us off our game. That's why we need to take care of ourselves. <laughs> all right? It, it's not just so that you can be healthy and happy. That's part of it. But it's so that we can maintain that balance in our lives. When we find ourselves in those situations, we need to be more on guard against Satan and his attacks. Do you know what the hardest day for pastors is? Anybody know? There's seven days in a week. What's the hardest day for pastors? Nope. Monday. Monday. Monday is a hard day for pastors. Why? Because they've given everything on Sunday. And Monday is when Satan attacks. Right? You get those phone calls. Pastor, I can't believe you said what you said on Sunday. Pastor, you were picking on me. Satan is an opportunist. Let's not forget that. We're seeing that in these days here. You've been without a pastor. Satan is an opportunist. Where there's no sheep or shepherd, what does he do? He gets into the sheep. All right? We need to be on guard, especially when we're under the gun. That's why we're exhorted over and over in Scripture. If you know of a brother or a sister who is facing difficult circumstances, what are we to do? Come alongside and pray. Pray. Pray one for another. You, you, you see that command repeated over and over in Scripture. Pray one for another. That's what's going to be our defense. So number one, we need to memorize God's word. We need to hide God's word in our heart that we would not sin against him. And secondly, 
Let's be a people of prayer. Let's pray that God would give us victory over sin. It's not sin to be tempted. It's sin when we give in to into temptation. But God has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow together in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We pray that you would, by your spirit, take that word and you would apply it to each of our hearts. Father, you know where we struggle. You know where Satan has those inroads into our lives. Father, we pray that you would give us the scripture verses to prepare ourselves to do battle against him. And that, Father, you would bind us together, that we would be praying one for another, especially in these days. So help us to not be defeated by sin, but help us to defeat sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and lead us in our closing song. Would you stand together? trust today that you're standing, not in your own strength, but you're standing 
on the promises of God. As we close, listen to these words. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May God bless you this week as you go to serve him. Let's open our mouths and declare we have victory in Jesus. God bless you. Thanks for coming today.